Chapter Eleven of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter Eleven England under Matilda and Stephen. The king was no sooner dead than all the plans and schemes he had laboured at so long and lied so much for crumbled away like a hollow heap of sand. Stephen, whom he had never mistrusted or suspected, started up to claim the throne. Stephen was the son of Adela, the conqueror's daughter, married to the Count of Blois. To Stephen, and to his brother Henry, the late king had been liberal, making Henry Bishop of Winchester, and finding a good marriage for Stephen, and much enriching him. This did not prevent Stephen from hastily producing a false witness, a servant of the late king, to swear that the king had named him for his heir upon his deathbed. On this evidence the Archbishop of Canterbury crowned him. The new king, so suddenly made, lost not a moment in seizing the royal treasure, and hiring foreign soldiers with some of it to protect his throne. If the dead king had even done as the false witness said, he would have had small right to will away the English people, like so many sheep or oxen, without their consent. But he had, in fact, bequeathed all his territory to Matilda, who, supported by Robert, Earl of Gloucester, soon began to dispute the crown. Some of the powerful barons and priests took her side, some took Stephen's, all fortified their castles, and again the miserable English people were involved in war, from which they could never derive advantage, whosoever was victorious, and in which all parties plundered, tortured, starved, and ruined them. Five years had passed since the death of Henry I, and during those five years there had been two terrible invasions by the people of Scotland under their king, David, who was at last defeated with all his army, when Matilda, attended by her brother Robert and a large force, appeared in England to maintain her claim. A battle was fought between her troops and King Stephen's at Lincoln, in which the king himself was taken prisoner, after bravely fighting until his battle-axe and sword were broken, and was carried into strict confinement at Gloucester. Matilda then submitted herself to the priests, and the priests crowned her Queen of England. She did not long enjoy this dignity. The people of London had a great affection for Stephen. Many of the barons considered it degrading to be ruled by a woman, and the Queen's temper was so haughty that she made innumerable enemies. The people of London revolted, and, in alliance with the troops of Stephen, besieged her at Winchester, where they took her brother Robert prisoner, whom, as her best soldier and chief general, she was glad to exchange for Stephen himself, who thus regained his liberty. Then the long war went on afresh. Once she was pressed so hard in the castle of Oxford, in the winter weather, when the snow lay thick upon the ground, that her only chance of escape was to dress herself all in white, and, accompanied by no more than three faithful knights, dressed in like manner that their figures should not be seen from Stephen's camp as they passed over the snow, to steal away on foot, cross the frozen Thames, walk a long distance, and at last gallop away on horseback. All this she did, but to no great purpose then for her brother dying while the struggle was yet going on, she at last withdrew to Normandy. In two or three years after her withdrawal, her cause appeared in England afresh in the person of her son Henry, young Plantagenet, who, at only eighteen years of age, was very powerful, not only on account of his mother having resigned all Normandy to him, but also from his having married Eleanor, the divorced wife of the French king, a bad woman who had great possessions in France. Louis, the French king, not relishing this arrangement, helped Eustace, King Stephen's son, to invade Normandy, but Henry drove their united forces out of that country, and then returned here to assist his partisans, whom the king was then besieging at Wallingford upon the Thames. Here, for two days, divided only by the river, the two armies lay encamped opposite to one another. On the eve, as it seemed to all men, of another desperate fight, when the Earl of Arundel took heart, and said that it was not reasonable to prolong the unspeakable miseries of two kingdoms to minister to the ambition of two princes. 
many other noblemen repeating and supporting this when it was once uttered, Stephen and young Plantagenet went down each to his own bank of the river, and held a conversation across it, in which they arranged a truce, very much to the dissatisfaction of Eustace, who swaggered away with some followers and laid violent hands on the Abbey of St. Edmundsbury, where he presently died mad. The truce led to a solemn council at Winchester, in which it was agreed that Stephen should retain the crown, on condition of his declaring Henry his successor, that William, another son of the King's, should inherit his father's rightful possessions, and that all the crown lands which Stephen had given away should be recalled, and all the castles he had permitted to be built demolished. Thus terminated the bitter war, which had now lasted fifteen years, and had again laid England waste. In the next year Stephen died, after a troubled reign of nineteen years. Although King Stephen was, for the time in which he lived, a humane and moderate man, with many excellent qualities, and although nothing worse is known of him than his usurpation of the crown, which he probably excused to himself by the consideration that King Henry I was a usurper too, which was no excuse at all, the people of England suffered more in these dread nineteen years than at any former period even of their suffering history. In the division of the nobility between the two rival claimants of the crown, and in the growth of what is called the feudal system, which made the peasants the born vassals and mere slaves of the barons, every noble had his strong castle, where he reigned the cruel king of all the neighbouring people. Accordingly he perpetrated whatever cruelties he chose, and never were worse cruelties committed upon earth than in wretched England in those nineteen years. The writers who were living then describe them fearfully. They say that the castles were filled with devils rather than with men, that the peasants, men and women, were put into dungeons for their gold and silver, were tortured with fire and smoke, were hung up by the thumbs, were hung up by the heels with great weight to their heads, were torn with jagged irons, killed with hunger, broken to death in narrow chests filled with sharp-pointed stones, murdered in countless fiendish ways. In England there was no corn, no meat, no cheese, no butter, there were no tilled lands, no harvests. Ashes of burnt towns and dreary wastes were all that the traveller, fearful of the robbers who prowled abroad at all hours, would see in a long day's journey, and from sunrise until night he would not come upon a home. The clergy sometimes suffered, and heavily too, from pillage but many of them had castles of their own, and fought in helmet and armour like the barons, and drew lots with other fighting men for their share of booty. The Pope, or Bishop of Rome, on King Stephen's resisting his ambition, laid England under an interdict at one period of this reign, which meant that he allowed no service to be performed in the churches, no couples to be married, no bells to be rung, no dead bodies to be buried. Any man having the power to refuse these things— no matter whether he were called a pope, or a poulterer, would, of course, have the power of afflicting numbers of innocent people. That nothing might be wanting to the miseries of King Stephen's time, the pope threw in this contribution to the public store, not very like the widow's contribution, as I think, when our Saviour sat in Jerusalem over against the treasury, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. End of chapter 11